So I have to admit that I felt a degree of guilt when I saw the promotional materials of this consortium. You have the beautiful Shenandoah Valley, farm to table meals, cocktails. It all sounds so idyllic, like a garden of Eden. And then I go and bring the mood down by talking about sin. <laughs> It is one of the downsides of writing a PhD on confession. You become very quickly known as the sin guy. <laughs> and then to be given the highly coveted postprandial time slot. <laughs> Meanwhile, you are digesting Chef's wonderful meal and heroically trying to concentrate on a talk by a theologian who decides to talk about such heavy topics as the transgression of the moral order. <laughs> With that confession out of the way, and I'm hoping that you will absolve me of this offence, let us begin with the topic. So the theme of this consortium is the kingship of Christ. I will begin by discussing the prototypical offence of Adam and Eve as a paradigm for rejecting this kingship. I will analyse some biblical examples in order to establish the very essence of this rejection. And then in the second part, I will present how this paradigm is inherited in our own time by a particular form of philosophy known as nominalism. And this philosophy coalesces in a particular view of the will and of freedom. And then finally, I will talk about the sacrament of penance and in particular, our participation in the sacrament. Because what we do in the sacrament, what we contribute, undoes the essence of sin at its very core. And furthermore, our participation gives human freedom a new possibility, sharing in divine freedom, sharing in Christ's own kingship. So, that's what I'm going to cover for the next 45 minutes. There will be some practical insights, which will be unusual. Academics normally go out of our way to be as impractical as possible <laughs> to ensure that theological reflection has no bearing on real life whatsoever. <laughs> so this will be a first, and it could well be a last. Okay. So, I want to begin with the analysis of the temptation narrative in order to understand the essence of sin. Now, the young married couple, Adam and Eve, find themselves on the proverbial sticky wicket. Thus far, we have had two chapters of sinlessness in the Bible. The remaining 1,332 will address the problem they have created. My students often ask me, how long did it take for the man and woman to sin? Now, if you follow the timeline in a literalistic manner, God creates the man and woman on the sixth day, then he rests on the seventh. It was probably later that same afternoon that they decide to engage in an ill-advised conversation with a reptile. Okay. It, well, it, didn't, it didn't take long, put it that way. So let us look at the narrative. This is in Genesis 3. The serpent said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, so just some commentary. The serpent's first statement, did God say, is actually not a question. In Hebrew, the conjunction tells us that it's actually a statement. He's making a statement. One scripture scholar said it's almost an expression of surprise. 
something like, indeed, to think that. So we could paraphrase it, the serpent's statement, and say, to think that God said you can't eat of any fruit, that's a surprise to me. Now, to her credit, the woman gives a reasonably solid answer to the serpent's question. But what is very interesting, however, is that he's promising her that she and her husband will be like God. And this is a very strange temptation because they were already like God. Genesis 1.26 says, God made man in his image after his likeness. So the man and the woman were already like God, but now they are being tempted to be like God in a different way. So let us continue now with the narrative. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, and he ate. Now just as a side note, both the Greek and Hebrew Bibles say she also gave some to a husband who was with her. Because the Greek and the Hebrew Bibles have Adam standing right next to her, not saying anything while she's being given the third degree by the serpent. But it doesn't appear in the Latin translation. Okay. So I want to make a few points regarding this temptation. First of all, up until this point, the narrative has given us these long descriptions of the world, of the garden, of the animals that inhabit creation. But when it comes to sin, the account only takes eight words. And this, to me, reveals a couple of interesting insights. So on the one hand, the work of creation takes a very long time. The work of destruction is very short. This is profoundly telling. It takes a long time to create initiatives and to bring them to fruition, and yet it is so easy to undo them by human sinfulness. But on the other hand, we see that sin is so anticlimactic. It is so undramatic. God creates the world with all its grandeur, and all its beauty, and the human person as high point. And then at first, sin allures us with its, with its surreal beauty, but when contrasted to the work of God, it is incomparably dull. So here's my second point. In the fall, an inversion of order takes place. Recall that in creation, it's God who sees. It's God who declares the goodness of creation. And then it's God who takes the woman and then fashions her out of the man's rib. So it's God who sees, declares, and takes. In the fall, the inversion happens. It's the woman and the man together with the serpent who become the prime actors. The woman sees that the tree was good. She takes the fruit. And so what sin does is it seeks to invert the original order of creation. It seeks to grasp the divine prerogative to declare good and evil. Now, as I said earlier, the man and the woman were already like God. Alone in all of the visible creation, they were made in the image and likeness of God. But now, however, they seek to be like God, but without God. They want this power of divine likeness for themselves. We call this the freedom of autonomy, or literally self-law. That's what the word autonomy <coughs> means. It means to be a law unto oneself, autonomos. Thus, sin and temptation promise a certain freedom, and I'll talk more about freedom and autonomy later. Okay, here's my final point. 
remember in this the order of temptation. It says the woman saw, she desired, and she took. So there's three words, saw, desired, and took. After this fall happens, sin then metastasizes throughout the world to the point where the whole human race is now implicated in this evil, and the Bible says that the man's heart is irredeemably evil. Now skip to Genesis 6, and keeping in mind, saw, desired, and took, that dynamic. It says here, when men began to multiply on the face of the ground, and daughters were born to them, here it comes, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair, and they took to wife such as those as they chose. So we see the same dynamic. They saw the daughters of men. They were fair, or we would say they were desirable, and they took as many as they chose. That same sin dynamic is unfolding a short three chapters later. Now there are other examples of this dynamic in the Bible, but I'm going to fast forward to the fall of King David. This is in 2 Samuel. So keeping in mind the sword desired and took. It says, It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking upon the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. You see that same threefold progression that he saw her, he desired her beauty, and then he took her. And this, as I said, this, this fall dynamic, this progression of sin, is present multiple times throughout the Old Testament. Now, it's referred to in the tradition as the threefold concupiscence. Just as a side note, the, the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience seek to undo this very dynamic, this, this seeing, desire, and taking. Christ's temptation in the desert is also structured upon this progression. And so when he conquers temptation, he's actually presenting himself as a new Adam, as a new King David, as someone who's, who conquers sin and temptation for the whole human race. Now, I'm going to return to this sin dynamic later when I get to the sacrament of penance. But for now, what I wish to do in the second part of my talk is to understand how the essence of this dynamic has continued over into our own time. Okay, so recall with sin, I said that it's what we call an autonomy. It's this self-law. This desire to be like God, to define good and evil, to define reality, and to even invert the created order. Now this impetus comes from the primordial desire for autonomy in the fall, and so it's, it's present in every age. This, this impetus is present in every age. But I would argue that it is uniquely present in modernity and in the West. And its philosophical antecedent, as it influences us today, comes from the 14th century. So it's a philosophy known as <coughs> nominalism. And I'll explain what that is shortly. But I have to say at the outset that it is paradoxical that nominalism sought to to, not only as it now we've inherited, it diminishes divine freedom, but actually it sought to protect it. That was why the Franciscans were promoting nominalism through William of Ockham. That was its goal. But unfortunately, what nominalism does is it proffers a vision of freedom that places divine freedom and human freedom in opposition. This is what game theorists call the zero-sum game. The idea is if God wins, then we lose. 
The only way for us to win is for God to lose. That's the zero-sum game. To place distinct free wills in opposition to each other is a vision of freedom that is very much alive and well in our own time. In our own day, gender theory gives eloquent expression to this attempt to pursue a freedom at the expense of all other freedoms, and furthermore, the desire to redefine reality. Now, recall a couple of summers ago, I was asked by admissions to meet with a prospective student and her family. It was your typical meeting. I was asking a whole series of questions, and the poor student was giving me these, these very nervous one-word answers. <laughs> But then we began to talk about theology, and the dad got really excited. And he actually took over the meeting, like, sort of like said to the daughter, sit over here, I now want to ask this guy questions. And so it became really, really enjoyable. But as we were leaving, he said to me, so when did this all go wrong? Like, when did things go south? And I, he said, was it the 1960s? And I said to him, no, it was the 1300s. Okay, this is, this is an error that has taken 700 years to bear fruit. The fix may not be that quick. Okay. So, this is the part of my talk where I want to trace the origins of nominalism in order to examine its effects on our freedom. And so that's what I want to do, is how does nominalism shape Western freedom? So, I gave you an optional reading, uh, I would be surprised if anybody did the reading. Um, but if you did, that's wonderful. But um, I would be, you did, your, you, did your penance, you did your penance early, all right. Um, but I gave it to you knowing that probably you wouldn't read it, and I would encourage you not to have read it until maybe after this. Okay, so you have, the, you have, it, in, you have it in an email. Here's the basic definition of nominalism. Nominalism holds that there are no essences. This, the term nominalism comes from the Latin word nomen, which means name. It means name. So with nominalism, there are no essences. Things are only what we name them. So in other words, there are no universals that the human mind can grasp. There are only individual realities that we name through our own will. So as I mentioned, William of Ockham, he died in 1347, was the father of nominalism. Uh, William once said, God could have redeemed us by becoming a donkey. So in other words, God did not have to share in our human nature. He simply could have become a donkey declared us saved, and we would have been saved. This is, this is a very Lutheran understanding of, of justification. So Lutherans are nominalists. Okay. Now, why would Occam say this? Why would Occam say there are no universals, there are no natures, that God can do whatever he wills? For Occam... If we say that there are natures, then this places a limit on the freedom of God. So if we say that there are natures, then this places a limit on God's freedom. If we say that a triangle must only have three sides, then God is bound to that. If we say that it is always morally wrong to kill the innocent, then God is boxed into that moral position. And so Occam is developing a new vision of freedom, not one based on reason or reality, but one that is based on the will. It's what we call voluntarism. This is, this is a freedom that is based purely on my will. So freedom is now no longer anchored in an objective reality. So it's no longer anchored in an objective reality, <coughs> such as 2 plus 2 equals 4. <coughs> Rather, freedom becomes entirely subjective. 2 plus 2 
could equal 5 for me. Okay. Now, I gave that example for a reason. Does anybody recall that tweet by Father Antonio Spadaro about four or five years ago? So let me, I've got the tweet here. This is what he tweeted. Theology is not mathematics. Two plus two in theology can make five. Because, and this is his rationale, it has to do with God and the real life of people. It has to do with the real life of people. He got massacred on Twitter, by the way. Um, for example, Francis Beckwith responded, true, math is not theology, but incoherence is a vice of reason, including theology, not just math, see St. Thomas Aquinas. Okay. But let's, I feel bad now because I've taken a dig at the Franciscans and the Jesuits. All right, I need to, I need to stop doing that. All right. Let us examine this. At the heart of nominalism is a view of freedom based on my subjective will, not objective truth. And this is why Spadaro, at least in this tweet, I'm not familiar enough with his work, is effectively a nominalist. And this is why he can tweet that in theology, two plus two can equal five because it has to do with the subjective experience of individuals. So for Spadaro, theology should focus not on faith-seeking understanding, that's not what theology is about for him, but rather faith proceeding from the will and individual experience. That's the work of theology for Spadaro. So while St. Thomas would say that our free will is strengthened through pursuing the good, and is in fact ordered to the good, not a nominalist. Nominalism proposes freedom simply as the independent power to choose between opposites. Nominalism is about pure will and not reason. So now we come to the question of God's freedom in nominalism. So for the nominalist, divine freedom equals total divine omnipotence, separated from any logos, from any rationality. That is God's power, that it even triumphs reason. Put simply, whatever God's will, God wills is good. God could command us to hate him, and that would be good. God could command us to hate our neighbor, to kill the infidel, and that would be good. Those would be salutary acts. Now this might sound strange and uncommon, but actually in talking to some Catholics, I see this almost de facto nominalism at work. I recall a devout young Catholic doctor, she was training to be an OBGYN, and unfortunately, she discovered that as part of a training that she would have to more than likely uh, participate in an abortion. And so she asked the Catholic Archbishop if he could give her a dispensation to participate in the termination. Yeah, it's crazy, but that, that's the rationale here is that, well, if the Archbishop says it's okay, then it's moral in this instance. That's nominalism. Now, where does this leave human freedom? Where does this vision of God's freedom leave human freedom? Put simply, we must obey. What Occam has achieved is the separation of God and the creature to the point of opposition. Now there is no longer an affinity between creator and creation, otherwise God would be bound by creation. However, if God's will is the only thing standing in the way of my will, then if I overthrow God, I will truly be free. I will be autonomous. I will be like God, declaring good and evil for me. Okay. 
So now I'm going to finish up the section on nominalism by giving a thumbnail sketch of how we inherit this. Over the, I'm going to sketch about the, the next 700 years in about three minutes. So first we have the scientific revolution. Here we have power over creation and nature. The human will can dominate creation. Then you have the industrial revolution. Here we have the power of mechanization. The will can achieve its end through technological dominance. Then we move to the sexual revolution with the power of pleasure over morality, the family, and now the body. And then in our own time, we have what's called the triumph of eros, the triumph of desire. Moral choices are nothing more than the expression of my will and my choice. I can even choose reality. So this is this triumph of eros, the domination of my will and my desires. I want to give you two examples of this nominalistic thinking today. Uh, the first was from Justice Anthony Kennedy. He said, at the heart of liberty, so at the heart of freedom, is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. This is godlike power that he's referring to. You will be like God. Uh, here is Judith Butler, the feminist. We act as if that the being of a man or that being of a woman is actually an internal reality or something that is simply true about us, a fact about us. But it's a phenomenon that is being produced all the time and reproduced all the time. So to say gender is performative is to say that nobody really is a gender from the start. So in other words, you need to be self-creating of your gender each day. Okay, this is, that's total gender fluidity. Okay. Now when Benedict, the, so Benedict XVI in 2006 gave this lecture called the Regensburg Address. He was teaching at the university, he came and gave the lecture at the university that he once taught at. And the address became infamous because the Holy Father quoted the Byzantine Emperor's negative assessment of Islam. And this was widely quoted in the media. Uh, violent protests erupted in the Islamic world and sadly a Catholic nun was killed in this. Now, the heart of Islam, the Islamic faith, is certainly nominalistic because it, its essence is the submission of the will to God. Okay. So Islam is, is very nominalist. But Benedict wasn't critiquing Islam. He was critiquing the West. In particular, he was criticizing the separation of faith from reason. But he was also addressing the voluntarism, this primacy of the will, of which I was speaking. And this primacy of will is present both in Islam, in the, in the sense that this is God's will, that's primacy, that's primary, and in the West, it's my will, that's primary. But both Islam and the West are grounded in the freedom of autonomy, of self-law. And if you recall, that's what I characterize as a zero-sum game. For me to be free, I must dominate all other freedoms. I now want to present the Catholic view of freedom. The Catholic understanding of the relationship of human and divine freedom is one of participation. It's one of participation. So we can participate in divine freedom. Although, of course, in a manner, in a manner that is subordinated to and dependent upon divine freedom. Now the language we use is called 
instrumental causality. In the words of the great Australian philosopher, Olivia Newton-John, let's get metaphysical. Okay. That's an 80s reference. Okay. A couple of laughs in the back. All right. Basically, in metaphysics, there are two types of causes. There is the principal cause, which is primary, and there's the instrumental cause, which is secondary. So, for example, you could have the, the primary cause in surgery is the surgeon. Okay. He's the primary cause. He's the principal cause. The instrumental cause, or the, the secondary cause, is the scalpel. Okay, this, is actually, this is probably a bad example to give up lunch, after lunch. Let's talk about a scholar with his pen. Okay, so the primary cause of a scholar putting his thoughts down on paper is the scholar. The secondary cause, the instrument that brings about the will of the primary cause is the pen. But notice that both the pen and the scalpel, these are instruments that are neither rational nor free. But when we act with God, God as principal cause, so God as primary cause, brings about his will through the free will of his creatures. That we become secondary causes of God's will in the world. And so we can truly build up God's kingdom, although always in a manner dependent upon and subordinated to God's will. So this is how St. Thomas Aquinas expresses it. And you'll have to bear with me because it's pretty scholastic, but I'll unpack it. So St. Thomas says, to have any good thing of oneself is more excellent than to have it from another. Now, a thing is said to have of itself that of which it is to some extent the cause. But whatever good we possess, the first cause by authority is God. And in this way, no creature has any good of itself. Nevertheless, in a secondary manner, anyone may be a cause to himself, or having certain good things inasmuch as he cooperates with God in the matter. And thus, whoever has anything by his own merit has in a manner of himself. He has it in a manner of himself. So what St. Thomas is saying is that when we do good, the primary cause of that goodness is God. We are the secondary causes of this good in a manner dependent upon God. But no, we are true causes. Even though we are secondary and we're dependent, we are nevertheless true causes. These are our actions. And so if I feed the hungry, if I give drink to the thirsty, then it truly becomes a meritorious act for me because it's my action, participating in God. I'm going to give two more examples of this Catholic view of freedom. This is from Pope Benedict, from his encyclical Deus Caritas Est. He says, the love story between God and man consists in the very fact that this communion of will increases in a communion of thought and sentiment. And thus our will and God's will increasingly coincide. God's will is no longer for me an alien will, something imposed on me from without by the commandments but it is now my own will, based on the realization that God is in fact more deeply present to me than I am to myself. So what Benedict is saying is that true freedom is a union of wills. It's a union of wills. The union of the human will and the divine will. So we don't obey a law that is imposed from us upon us from the outside by some nominalist God. Rather, I love what, God's lo what God loves. God wants my holiness, and so I lovingly and freely unite myself to God's will. 
And then finally, I want to talk about John, John Paul II. Now, in this quote, John Paul is talking about human to human participation, but it's very easy to translate it into our participation with God. So, this is what John Paul said. He says, This is precisely what I mean by participation, namely, the ability to exist and act together with others in such a way that in this existing and acting we remain ourselves and actualize ourselves, which means our own eyes, our own selves. So what John Paul is saying is that participation is me existing and acting with another. And so participate in the will of God is to both exist with God and to act with God. And when I exist with God and act with God, two things happen. Number one, I remain myself. I don't lose myself in any way when I participate in God's freedom. I think this is what we often get afraid about when it comes to doing God's will. We're afraid that it's going to lead us to where we don't want to go. But we never lose ourselves in participating in God. And this is the second thing. We actualize ourselves. We become more fully who God created us to be. So, to contrast this Catholic view against the nominalist, I refer to the nominalist as autonomy, self-law. The Catholic view is participated theonomy, participated theonomy. Theonomy just means God's law. Okay. So the Catholic understanding of freedom and participation is that we can participate in divine law. Divine freedom is such that it can even create a space for human freedom to act, to be perfected, and to even be redeemed. Okay, so now I come to the practical part of my talk, the sacrament of penance. And to this end, I want to address two issues. One is, how do I get more out of the sacrament? And then secondly, to return to that sin dynamic that I spoke about, that see, desire, and take. Because the sacrament of penance is actually a cure for that disease. So, I hear this a lot. How do I get more out of the sacrament of penance? I would say, just don't sin so much. But that's not a good enough, that's not a good enough answer. Um, we, need to sort of, we need to sort of back it up a little bit to understand um, what was the purpose of the Council's reform of the sacrament. So we often hear about the spirit of Vatican II. Now, I would contend that if the Council actually had a spirit, apart from the Holy Spirit, it was this, the renewal of the sacrament of penance in the life of the Church. So that, that was the spirit of the, the Second Vatican Council, to renew the sacrament of penance in the life of the Church. Now, I hold this because when you look at the, the Second Vatican Council, it was bookended by the call to conversion and repentance. On the eve of the Council, John XXIII issued an encyclical on doing penance. At the close of the Council, Paul VI promulgated an apostolic exhortation asking the church to do penance. And so the true spirit of the council was a renewal of the sacrament of penance within the context of the call to conversion. And the goal was that Christian conversion would be a sign of the church's holiness in the world. So to that end, the Council Fathers hoped that Christians would live the virtue of penance, the virtue of penance in their lives, and then bring this virtue of penance to the sacrament of penance. So I need to explain what a virtue is first, and then explain the virtue of penance. So a virtue is often referred to as a habit. Now when we think of habits, we think of blind habits, like this person has this He's got a blind habit, he never thinks about it, he keeps playing with his beard, it's really annoying. Okay. But virtues are not blind. Virtues are stable actions. 
They're actions that I can perform consistently, with ease, with promptness, and with joy. So if I have the virtue of patience, in challenging circumstances, I will act consistently with patience. There will even be an ease to my acting. There won't be a battle to be patient. And I do so quickly, and I do so joyfully. On the other hand, if I struggle to be patient, if it takes me a long time to be patient, I just need to sort of take a deep breath, or if I do so begrudgingly, then I'm just not a patient person. I don't have the virtue of patience. The virtue of penance is the consistent disposition of repenting for past sins and the desire to grow in perfection. The person who has the virtue of penance, they repent of their past sins and they seek to grow in Christian perfection. And it leads them then to undertake various penances, meatless Fridays, a small daily sacrifices, so that I can grow in my love of neighbor and of God. Practically, it means keeping our hearts turned away from sin and selfishness, to keep our hearts turned away from sin and selfishness, to keep our hearts turned to God, to our family, and to our neighbor. It means to be mindful of God's mercy and his generosity and to praise it. And then lastly, it means to perform works of service with and through Christ. And so the person who does this is pursuing the virtue of penance. And when we do this, what happens is that we begin to cultivate in our hearts a rich soil that the sacrament of penance can actually take root in and bear fruit. And so we have to remember that what we do actually strengthens our participation in the sacrament. St. Thomas said this. St. Thomas said that you actually contribute to the efficacy of the sacrament of penance. He said that you, that you co-posit the sacramental sign, that the penitent co-posits, the penitent contributes the sacramental sign. So it's never just about getting absolution, but it's about bringing our converted hearts, moved by grace, to encounter God's forgiveness through the church. And that's what produces forgiveness in the sacrament. That's St. Thomas. The rite itself says that the penitent celebrates the sacrament together with the priest. The penitent celebrates the sacrament together with the priest and that he or she plays an integral role in his or her conversion. So the short answer to how does one get more out of the sacrament is to live the virtue of penance in our lives and to know that what you do in the sacrament contributes to its efficacy. Okay, we, can, we can talk more about that in question time. Okay, so this is the last part of my talk, and this is to consider the sacrament and that sin dynamic that I spoke about. So in the sacrament of penance, the church calls the parts that the, sac the penitent plays, through, the church calls it contrition, confession, and satisfaction. Those are the names of the parts that you play in the sacrament. Contrition, confession, and satisfaction. So contrition is the sorrow for sin and the desire to sin no more. In contrition, my heart has turned away from sin and now I have begun the conversion process, the, the coming back to God and to his church. Confession is the naming of my sin and giving it to the church. It's, it's, I'm declaring my sorrow and my contrition in speech. That's what confession is. But confession is also a praise of God's mercy. It's a confession of praise. So your, your confession is actually prayer. The church is actually executing her liturgy of penance through you because you are a Christian. And then lastly is the satisfaction or the penance that the priest will assign you. 
St. John Paul said that this is the crowning of the sacrament, that this completes the sacrament, that it demonstrates that our hearts have truly turned away from sin. Now, these actions of the penitent are not arbitrary, but they actually go to the very heart of sin and the process of conversion. They go to the very heart of turning away from sin. And in doing this, they root out sin at its very source. Now, recall that dynamic. See, desire, take. So I see a sinful action. It's something that I, it comes to my mind. Then I begin to desire it in my heart. Because if it comes to your mind, sometimes we just push it away. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to do that. But then the heart begins to be engaged and you start to desire it. This is something that I want to do. This is a good for me. And then finally I take an action. The action could be a thought, it could be a word, it could be a sin of commission, it could be a sin of omission. But in any event, once I've taken the action, the sin is now complete. Now, with these actions of the penitent, contrition, confession, and satisfaction, we see this dynamic. In contrition, we see. We see that we have sinned against God and the church. We're sorry. We repent. But we could just stop there. But in confession, we desire. Confession is the desiring to bring my contrition to the church to show that my heart has turned away from sin and that conversion has begun to take root. But confession is not enough for the conversion to be completed. In satisfaction, we take action with the purpose of amendment to sin no more and now conversion is complete. So contrition, confession and satisfaction actually follows the very same sin dynamic that we see in, with Adam and Eve, the seeing, desiring, and taking. And in this way, forgiveness, conversion, reconciliation, undoes sin at its very center. It undoes the disease at the very cause of the disease and, and roots it out. But remember also, that at the foundation of sin is this desire for a false freedom and autonomy, the preference of my law over God's law. However, to receive the sacrament of penance with a heart turned away from sin, with the desire for Christian perfection, is to prefer God's law and his holiness and to want to participate in it. So contrition, confession, and satisfaction undoes sin at its root, but more deeply, aided by grace, we are sharing in God's own freedom. So to conclude, this is what John Paul II said. He said, Christians exercise their baptismal kingship above all in the spiritual combat where they seek to overcome in themselves the kingdom of sin. So this is when we are acting as kings, when we seek to overcome the kingdom of sin. In another place he said, Christian morality combines the element of sacrifice proper to a priesthood with the kingly element of victory, of man's dominion over himself. So to do battle and to seek to overcome sin is to have the freedom of a king. More specifically, it is to share in Christ's kingship and his victory over sin on the cross. Thus, to engage in this battle through the sacrament and through the virtue of penance is to have a royal freedom, the freedom of the sons and daughters of God. With the acts of the penitent in the sacrament, this contrition, confession, and penance, we ultimately, through the grace of absolution, remove sin both at its source, but in its prototypical essence as the pursuit of false freedom. 
Benedict XVI once said that the new evangelization begins in the confessional. The only answer to the illusory freedom of postmodernity is the beauty of holiness and conversion, participation in the life of grace, and a sharing in the dominion and kingship of Christ. Thank you.